In the 1960s, a group of scientists set up base in St. Thomas, a small island located in the American Virgin Islands territory. Their mission? To study dolphins and attempt to teach them English. Sound bizarre? Well, buckle up, because things are about to get even weirder. New discoveries had recently been made about the animal mind, leading researchers to theorize that it could in fact be possible to communicate with other species. Specifically, they wanted to see if it was possible to teach dolphins to speak. And while the work was ambitious and their goals were lofty, some say the experiment was a total failure. I'm Brooke. Today, we'll be diving into the 1965 Dolphin House experiment. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Armchair Investigator. If you've ever wished to talk to animals to know what your dog, cat, or bird was thinking, you're not alone. Some of the earliest experiments dedicated to communicating with animals involved teaching apes sign language and even how to speak English. Yes, you're very good. Good go. Good go. Where? You? But by the late 1950s, when no real progress had been made, Scientific research into communicating with animals significantly slowed down. But not for Dr. John C. Lilly, a well-respected brain scientist who was working for the American National Institute of Mental Health during the 1950s. His area of expertise centered around what the brains of animals could tell us about our own. John's fascination with marine mammals began in 1949, after coming across a beached pilot whale on the coast near his home in Massachusetts. When John learned about the size of a whale's brain, he imagined just how intelligent these creatures must be. In the years that followed, John and his wife took every opportunity to observe marine mammals, oftentimes by chartering sailboats. It was on one of these trips that John and his wife came across marine studios in Miami, the first place to keep the bottlenose dolphin in captivity. Leaping three feet out of water and through a small hoop is only one of the accomplishments of Flippy, the pride of the studios at Marineland, Florida. Flippy gets a big kick out of demonstrating his high IQ. It wasn't long before John honed in on the brains of bottlenose dolphins. You see, their brain is larger and more complex than a human brain, and their auditory cortex is highly developed, as is their neocortex, the part of the brain responsible for problem-solving, self-awareness, and a variety of other traits we associate with human intelligence. In order to have access to study dolphins and their brains, John moved to Florida in the mid-1950s, where he began doing brain experiments on the dolphins at Marine Land of Florida and recording their reactions. John's work involved mapping their cerebral cortex using small probes that he'd created for his research on the brains of rhesus monkeys. His work on the dolphins had to be done while the dolphin was awake, as they stopped breathing under anesthesia. One day in 1957, John's wife Mary noticed a reaction from the dolphins that the others had missed. And this discovery would change not only the course of John's work, but his life. John's wife had noticed that the dolphins were imitating John's voice patterns as he spoke. Mary said, I came in at the top of the operating theater and heard John talking. And the dolphin would go, wah, 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 like John. And then Alice, his assistant, would reply in a high tone of voice. And the dolphin would imitate her voice. I went down to where they were operating and told them that this was going on. And they were quite startled. John became convinced that not only were the dolphins imitating humans, but they were actively trying to communicate with them. This was such a monumental discovery for John that in 1961, he published a book called Man and Dolphin, where he discussed his findings, including his predictions that at some point in the future, we would be communicating with other species. John's research not only caught the interest of the public, but also that of NASA. Launch vehicles are developed and tested to provide the rocket thrust required for space missions, both manned and unmanned, to explore the boundless new world of outer space. 
from the suborbital flights of astronauts Shepard and Grissom to the Earth orbital flights of Glenn, Carpenter, Schirra, and Cooper, the scientific step-by-step -step approach of the Mercury program proved to be 100% effective. You see, the United States was in the midst of a heated space race, a period of competition between the Soviet Union and the United States over who could conquer space exploration first. John's work caught the attention of a team of American astronomers led by Dr. Frank Drake, who were searching for extraterrestrial life. They had just completed the first experiment to detect signals from extraterrestrials using a radio telescope at Green Bank in West Virginia. Dr. Drake and his team were specifically intrigued about the notion of other species being just as intelligent and cultured as humans. There might be other civilizations in space attempting to send us messages. The detection of extraterrestrial signals are going to be one of the most exciting things that ever happened. They believed there was a lot they could learn from John and his research, especially when it came to any obstacles and challenges involved in establishing communication with other intelligent species. John was convinced that his dolphins were uttering coherent words in English, but at a speed so rapid and a pitch so high that only computerized manipulation could make them understandable. At conferences, John was astounding those in attendance with his slow-down recordings of dolphins seemingly speaking words in English. Meanwhile, John wanted to take his research even deeper. And he knew that NASA was well-funded. This could be a win-win for everyone involved. John could explore interspecies communication further and share his findings with NASA while they helped fund the project. And his proposition worked. Not only was NASA helping to fund John's research, but he got other government agencies like the U.S. Navy to get on board, too. This could be an opportunity to explore ways to translate an alien language in order to communicate with extraterrestrials should they ever visit us. In 1958, he established the Communication Research Institute in the Virgin Islands. And in 1961, John commissioned a lab to be built right on the shores of St. Thomas, a white villa he named Dolphin Point Laboratory, a.k.a. the Dolphin House. And because John and his team were a thousand miles from the United States mainland, they could ideally focus without interruption on human communication with dolphins. The lab was built over a single 65-foot-long, 20-foot-wide, and 4.5-foot-deep outdoor pool that had its own supply of fresh seawater. A below-ground window was installed that would allow the team to observe the dolphins underwater. John brought three dolphins from Marine Studio in Miami, Peter, Pamela, and Sissy. They had all co-starred in the television series Flipper. Sissy was the biggest dolphin and also the most boisterous. She was social and outgoing, and out of the three dolphins, seemed to be the one in charge. The second female, Pamela, was timid and shy, and unlike Sissy, she didn't open up to humans right away. Then there was six-year-old Peter, the only male dolphin of the trio. The facility was supplying the dolphins with 15 to 20 pounds of frozen butterfish per day, that was shipped in from the United States mainland and stored in a deep freeze chest. John's research had three main principles. Seek the truth no matter the cost. Streamline yourself with the research, meaning getting rid of personal guilt and emotional blockages, and create routines, but be willing to be flexible enough to modify them if needed. John's team consisted of linguist and anthropologist Gregory Bateson and his family, the island veterinarian, and eventually, 22-year-old Margaret Howe. 
Margaret, who had been living on St. Thomas, was always in search of adventure and excitement. In December of 1963, her brother-in-law mentioned a secret laboratory at the eastern end of the island where they were working with dolphins. By January of 1964, curiosity had gotten the best of her, and she decided to check things out. Despite seeing the signs that said, keep out, Margaret put herself out there and asked if there was any way she could be of help. And her tenacity paid off. Gregory Bateson asked her to sit and observe the dolphins. He wanted her to write down what she saw while also giving her own interpretation of what she thought was happening. And Gregory liked what Margaret had written. He could appreciate her way of explaining and observing things. By the end of that day, Margaret left with an invitation to come back anytime she wanted, though was told up front that they couldn't afford to pay her. But Margaret didn't seem to mind. She was just thrilled that she was getting the opportunity to work with dolphins up close and personal, spending the next three months observing the dolphins and writing about their behavior. John had also tasked Margaret with reading the book, The Planet of the Apes. By February of 1964, the lab was in full operation, and even though this was John's project, he wasn't actually around much, only spending about five days out of the month there. Most of his time was spent traveling to spread awareness and raising funds for continued research. On February 7, 1964, Margaret was officially added to the roster as a Communication Research Institute staff member. John put her in charge of taking over the mimicry work he'd started in Florida, tasking her with helping the dolphins learn to produce the sounds and human speech. Now, the reason dolphins are even remotely able to mimic voice patterns is because of the blowhole on the top of their heads. When a dolphin is forcing air out of their lungs, the flap of the blowhole opens and closes, thus producing sounds. This is actually one of the ways in which dolphins will communicate with one another in the wild. In the book, The Mind of the Dolphin, John discusses mimicry as a sign of not only a drive, but an ability to communicate. In essence, mimicry allows a subject to put out sounds, hear their own production of the sounds, and then compare it to what they were modeling. For the mimicry work, Margaret ultimately chose to focus on Peter, as he hadn't had any human speech training, while Pamela and Sissy had. Margaret's first goal was to get Peter to actually listen to her while she spoke. In order to help him do this, she would listen to him while he spoke and not interrupt. On April 10th, Margaret began her first vocal lessons with Peter. She had Peter make a sound before he was given fish as a reward. From there, Margaret focused their twice daily lessons on the alphabet, first teaching Peter vowel sounds. I'm with Peter A.M. Hello. Hello. Clearly, Peter. Hello. No. Hello. Better. One, two, three. English, Peter. Now, come on, listen to me. One, two, no. One, two, three. One, two, three. You can do better, Peter. And while the work was by no means easy, before long, he was showing progress. He learned to stay silent during instruction. There were also numerous times throughout the experiment Hello. where it was clear Peter could do something, yet no. still chose to do it incorrectly. John and Margaret theorized that he did this as a way to get Margaret to talk to him rather than at him. But after a certain point, Peter's progress seemed to plateau. That is, until Margaret had an idea. You see, at this point, nobody was actually living at the villa. At the end of the day, the team would lock up the compound and head home. Margaret believed that the time when everyone left the villa at night until they arrived the next morning was wasted opportunity for learning. In an interview with BBC, she stated, Every night, we would all get in our cars and pull the garage door down and drive away. 
and I thought, well, there's this big brain floating around all night. It amazed me that everybody kept leaving, and I just thought it was wrong. Margaret's solution to this was to move into the dolphin house full time. And not only that, but she was going to live side by side with the dolphins. An idea that John loved. But first, they needed to see how it would play out. From March 20th to the 27th, a seven-day preliminary experiment was conducted in which Margaret stayed in a large portable tank filled with 16 inches of water with one of the female dolphins named Pam. This gave Margaret and the team valuable insights into what challenges they might come across during the extended live-in experiment. After that, they began to prepare for the two-and-a-half-month experiment that was to begin on June 15, 1965 and end in early September. With John's approval, Margaret drew up new plans for the villa, completely revamping the layout of the upstairs room and making them waterproof. The plan was to flood the place knee-deep with water, including the balcony, so that the dolphins could move freely inside and outside the house with Margaret. The villa had a large electric hoist elevator that they would use to move the dolphins from floor to floor using a support sling. The house was left with a few dry areas that weren't flooded with water at all, an area for food storage and refrigerators, a bathroom, and another sleeping area, though Margaret didn't use them. All electrical outlets were relocated to just one dry room in which extension cords were ran from. The lights were replaced with waterproof ones. And while it may not have been an ideal living situation for just anyone, it worked. Margaret had the basic necessities she'd need for the next few months, including a small two-burner electric cooktop. She even had a desk that was suspended from the ceiling. Margaret and Peter were literally spending the whole day together, and when it was time to go to bed, Peter even slept next to her. It wasn't long before Peter was on the same sleep schedule as his teacher. Margaret was 100% dedicated to the experiment. She even cut her hair to a quarter of an inch to make things easier. On June 15th, Margaret's first night in the dolphin house, lying in bed surrounded by water, she questioned what she was doing, saying, human people were out there having dinner or whatever, and here I am. There's moonlight reflecting on the water, this fin and this bright eye looking at you, and I thought, wow, why am I here? But then you get back into it, and it never occurred to me not to do it. What I was doing there was trying to find out what Peter was doing there and what we could do together. That was the whole point, and nobody had done that. Their daily schedule went something like this. At 7.30 a.m., Margaret woke up, dressed, and ate breakfast. From 8 to 8.30, she recorded lessons with Peter and fed him five pounds of fish. At 9 a.m., she completed the daily chores, fed the other dolphins, and took notes. From 10 to 10.30, Margaret and Peter would play and record some light lessons. At 11.30, Margaret would eat lunch. From 12 to 12.30, the two would complete a lesson and Peter would be fed another five pounds of fish. The time from 1 to 2.30 was more or less free time in which Margaret could take a nap, read, write, or relax. From 3 to 3.30, the two completed another lesson and Peter would get an additional five pounds of fish. The time from 4 to 4.30 was spent working together. From 5 to 5.30, Margaret would take notes, file paperwork, and work on lessons for the following day. At 6 o'clock, she would eat dinner. From 6.30 until bedtime, the two were playing games, chatting with visitors, and relaxing. At 10 o'clock, it was lights out and time for bed. This schedule was followed Sunday through Friday, with Saturdays being a free day for Margaret and a pool day for Peter to be with Pamela and Sissy. With Margaret at the Dolphin House day and night, she had effectively brought Peter into her world. Believing that living with Peter around the clock, he would naturally pick up on human sounds. Just like how a human baby naturally learns to speak from constantly being immersed in, hearing language, and being spoken to. In order to teach Peter how to talk, Margaret spoke using single words at a time and made sure to heavily emphasize inflections something the dolphins were good at mimicking. The enunciation part, not so much. See, dolphins can't produce all 44 sounds in the English language. For instance, the sound M makes M is quite difficult for them. And try as Peter might, he never could quite produce the sound. Can you say Margaret? 
No. Margaret. Come on, Peter. Yes, ma'am. Margaret. To draw attention to her mouth and lips, Margaret even began painting the lower half of her face white in hopes that it would help Peter see how he needed to move his blowhole in order to produce sounds. He needed to learn how to make the sounds in order to say words. Then he needed to learn the meaning behind the words, a process in which the team agreed could take place in separate steps or simultaneously. The language lessons centered around using basic vocabulary for pronunciation and comprehension in categories like numbers, personal names, greetings, objects, and actions. Margaret wrote the following in her diary about their first week. Peter was brought upstairs on Monday. He seemed happy and content in his new home. The first few nights in the flooded room were awful. I was uncomfortable and hardly slept. Later, I seemed to adjust, and by Thursday, I was fine. Peter is his energetic self and a bit nippy on the toes. I carry a long-handled broom with me for that and ward him off. Lessons have gone fairly well. I start with counting and shapes. He had picked up a nice business of following the inflection in my voice. One, two, three, four, with an upturn on the four. A good deal of the talk Peter does when he is alone is now humanoid. Interesting and encouraging. And while their speech lessons were important, Margaret believed that they made the most progress outside their official lessons, saying, When we had nothing to do was when we did the most. He was very, very interested in my anatomy. If I was sitting here and my legs were in the water, he would come up and look at the back of my knee for a long time. He wanted to know how that thing worked, and I was so charmed by it. At the end of their second week, Margaret wrote, Several new things developed this week. First, Peter and I got on a more sociable physical level. Peter began to be gentle with me and allow me to come to him without the broom. He didn't nip at me as he used to. During John's trips back to the Dolphin House, he was ecstatic with the progress that Margaret was making, saying, I feel armed with the kind of knowledge that we never could have obtained except through these experiments. John felt the only thing to do was to keep supporting and encouraging Margaret's work. But not everybody was as enthusiastic with the notion of teaching dolphins English, including linguist Gregory Bateson. He wasn't confident in the quality of research being done. He believed his work on dolphin-to-dolphin -dolphin communication was much more valuable. But Margaret wasn't giving up. She was constantly looking for ways to keep Peter engaged in their lessons, often using Peter's natural curiosity to her advantage. Margaret would present Peter with various toys and shapes, Fish naming each object bucket. as she went. She tried to make as many things into a game as she could, as that's what Peter responded to best. By the fourth weekend, Margaret wrote, I find that more and more Peter is humanoiding to me or at me to get attention. I respond as often as possible. I will be in bed or cooking, and if Peter speaks to me in humanoid, I drop what I'm doing and go to him or else try to engage him in conversation. I do not respond to his attention-getting clicks and whistles. They mean nothing to me, and I make that clear. By the fifth week, Margaret wrote that Peter could listen and speak with a good 95% humanoid, and only an occasional comment in Delphinese on the side. He could also somewhat imitate the words ball and hello. Even though Gregory Bateson wasn't interested in Margaret's work, the astronomers led by Dr. Drake were. In the summer of 1965, so roughly a year and a half after the lab was fully operational, they sent astronomer Carl Sagan to the Dolphin House to see how things were progressing with interspecies communication. And what Carl discovered left him wanting more. The reality was that Peter was a long way from being able to understand and speak English. Carl suggested that instead of trying to teach dolphins how to speak English, they instead focus on learning how dolphins communicate with each other. Much like what Gregory Bateson was already doing. One experiment the astronomers suggested was to figure out how in-depth and complex communication got between dolphins. What would happen if they put two dolphins in separate tanks where they could hear but not see each other? Could they teach one dolphin how to obtain food and see if it could tell the other dolphin how to do the same thing in its tank? And while this was certainly an interesting question, 
John just wasn't interested in redirecting Margaret's focus. Instead, he instructed her to continue her English lessons with Peter. Margaret believed that Peter's vocalization had improved. He had tone, control, and proper spacing between his words. But perhaps most importantly, she believed Peter was truly trying. Margaret wrote in her diary, I am now no longer thinking in terms of three months. I think in terms of forever. And then, something happened that would reaffirm the notion of communication between species being possible. One day, Andy Williams, the island vet, had brought his small dog Suki to the dolphin house with him. And while Andy was in the pool with the dolphins, Suki jumped in, unaware of the dolphins in the pool. Once poor Suki realized what was in the water with her, she freaked out clinging to Andy as if her life depended on it. That's when Peter approached the frightened dog, making clicking sounds as if he were speaking directly to Suki. Suki jumped off Andy's shoulder and began swimming around and playing with the dolphins. It was clear that whatever Peter said put the dog at ease. She no longer viewed the dolphins as a threat. But the question remains, how was Suki able to understand what Peter was saying? Margaret's work continued to progress, but by the fifth week, something else was getting in the way of their lessons, and Margaret found that their play sessions were changing too. Peter was becoming too excited, if you catch my drift. That is, his sexual urges were affecting their work. Margaret wrote, I can feel his mounting frustration, and he is impossible to work with following this. Peter was constantly rubbing himself on Margaret's hand, foot, or knee, and she had bruises and scrapes on her legs from Peter butting into her. She wrote, I have decided that Peter must go downstairs with Pam and Sissy for at least a day. I think that's only fair after, say, a month with only me, that he joined them for a day or so. Margaret hoped that a day with the other dolphins would relieve his frustrations, enough that the two of them could go on another month without those types of interruptions. She also thought of finding a way to satisfy the dolphin's needs without another dolphin. Could this strengthen the bond between human and dolphin? Or could it become too much of a distraction? She wasn't sure. But as Peter's urges grew, loading him onto the elevator to take him down to the pool with Pamela and Sissy became too disruptive to their lessons. Margaret felt the best way to get Peter's attention back on the work was to manually relieve him herself. She said it was just easier to incorporate that and let it happen. It had just become part of what was going on. Like an itch, you just get rid of that. We'll scratch it and we'll be done and move on. In her eyes, she was there to work with Peter. And that was just a part of Peter. Margaret was very open with the team about what she was doing. It wasn't private, meaning people could observe it. And while the Dolphins veterinarian was happy that she was no longer being physically hurt, he did worry about the effects it would have on Peter, because as he put it, Peter was madly in love with Margaret. With Gregory Bateson's work on dolphin-to-dolphin -dolphin communication progressing in the pool outside, he saw mostly everything unfolding in real time, and began to seriously question the value and integrity of John and Margaret's research. Gregory believed that Peter was simply copying Margaret's sounds, and had no real understanding of what he was even repeating. Just because Peter could say something that resembled the word triangle doesn't mean he understood what a triangle was. Aww. Getting an animal to say human words doesn't demonstrate its ability to understand what those words mean. Gregory believed the key to unlocking a species' capacity for language lied in that species' language and how they communicate with one another. Gregory wasn't the only one having serious doubts about the value of John's work. Those funding his research began sharing similar sentiments. They were concerned that John might be cherry-picking his data, carefully selecting the snippets of Dolphinese that resembled human language, and excluding the rest. After Carl Sagan's visit in the summer of 1965, they began to pull their funding. Desperate to keep his funding for the Dolphin House, John turned his focus to something else. 
I'm Mike Wallace, and this is a CBS classic, LSD, The Spring Grove Experiment. I was dust, and I was inside the earth. Huge boulders. This woman is one of the principals in a controlled scientific investigation of LSD. She With research into the use of psychedelics peaking in the 1950s and 60s, it doesn't come as much of a surprise that John, a brain scientist, would eventually find his way to experimenting with LSD, especially since its mind-expanding capabilities were being promoted by big names like Harvard scientist Timothy Leary and writer Ken Kesey. John was interested in how humans reacted to LSD, and he began experimenting on himself after being introduced to the substance in a Malibu beach house in 1964. As the LSD kicked in, John wrote that he suddenly realized that all of his previous training leading up to this point, all of his preparation had been worth it. With John regularly using LSD, those who knew him said they noticed a complete change in him, saying that he went from a white lab coat scientist to a full-blown hippie. In the province of the mind, what one believes to be true either is true or becomes true within certain limits. These limits are to be found experimentally and experientially. When so found, these limits turn out to be further beliefs to be transcended. In the province of the mind, there are no limits. However, in the province of the body, there are definite limits not to be transcended. Eventually, John wanted to see how dolphins would react to LSD, curious about the effect it would have on them. In April of 1964, while returning from Hawaii on a United Airlines flight, John wrote to Gregory Bateson, Dear Gregory, did you ever do any serious research with LSD? Its effect on communication? On yourself? With music, noises, etc.? I'm going to get some to try in a dolphin to see if it forgets to breathe under its influence. Prior to this, nobody knew how dolphins would react to LSD but they knew that humans reacted to it in a multitude of different ways. John even wondered if it would make dolphins who have a voluntary respiratory system, meaning their conscious breathers, forget to breathe. Once John had his mind made up, there was no convincing him otherwise. As a young woman in her early 20s, Margaret knew she couldn't stop John, but she insisted that he leave Peter out of it. He agreed though ultimately Peter would be given LSD in April of 1965, though the recordings of Peter on LSD have little to no vocalization in them. The day of his first experiment, John's team waited with bated breath to see what would happen to Pamela and Sissy after being injected. Just after 10 p.m., John administered a 200 microgram dose to each dolphin, and then they waited, and waited, and waited some more but nothing happened. Wanting to invoke some type of response, John grabbed a jackhammer and began using it near the dolphin pool, which is just cruel considering how sensitive dolphins are to sounds and how they use it for echolocation. But even then, nothing happened. After that night, everyone around John began to view him differently. Where was the well-respected brain scientist they had once admired? When John continued to inject the dolphins with LSD despite getting no response from them, people were upset. Gregory Bateson decided he had seen enough. It was time for him and his family to go. By the summer of 1966, with no more funding, John was racking up large debts. But his attention was so focused on LSD that little else mattered. Not long after, the dolphin house closed and Margaret went from running the place to decommissioning it. In October of 1966, the dolphins were flown back to Miami. John assured the vet and Margaret that the dolphins were going to a good home, one where they would be happy. In reality, they were headed to another private lab, a far cry from the life they had in St. Thomas. At the new lab, they were kept in small plastic tanks and received little to no natural light. John's friend, Rick O'Berry, said, It was awful, to be frank. It was awful. The first thing that hit you was the smell. Weeks passed, and then Margaret received a phone call from John. He had wanted to tell her the news himself. Peter 
was dead. The dolphin had ended his own life. As I had briefly touched on earlier, a dolphin's body doesn't automatically breathe for them, as it does for us. As humans, we don't even have to think about breathing. We can go about our lives and focus on other things. But for a dolphin, every breath they take is a conscious effort. If they choose not to take another breath, it's a way they can end things. For Peter, they felt that the move from the dolphin house to the lab in Miami, along with losing Margaret, was too much. All these years later, many language experts look back at John's research as nothing more than a sophisticated mimicry experiment. Peter was never able to spontaneously communicate with Margaret or anyone, though Margaret believes that it was because the experiment was stopped too early. She truly believed that had she had more than six months with Peter, Peter could have made much, much more progress. Today, the Dolphin House isn't remembered for the research conducted there, nor is it remembered for the information discovered. Instead, it's mostly remembered for Margaret's intimate interactions with Peter. When the findings of what took place at the Dolphin House were published in the 70s, imaginations ran wild, with adult magazines publishing spicy stories between a woman and a dolphin. Despite the failure of the Dolphin House experiments, John's interest in communicating with dolphins continued well into the 70s and 80s, including experiments in which he tried communicating with them telepathically and by teaching them codes. As the years went by, John's view of dolphins started to change. It became more than just studying them. He no longer felt comfortable with keeping them confined and ended up releasing his dolphins, Joe and Rosie, John was actually issued the first ever permit in the United States to release dolphins. Later stating, I had no right to confine them, to imprison them, to work on them. My only right would be to work with them in their natural habitat, in their natural state. By the mid-1980s, John was advocating against holding dolphins captive. He spent the last 20 years of his life working to protect cetaceans, that is, dolphins, whales, and porpoises, and traveling around the world to spread awareness. In September of 2001, he died from heart failure at the age of 86. Margaret stayed in St. Thomas and married John Lavat, the photographer who had taken pictures of the research being done at the Dolphin House. Margaret and John would continue living in the Dolphin House for another 10 years, converting it into a family home and raising three girls there. Margaret wrote about the effects that isolation had on her throughout the 10-week period. She stated that several times over the course of the experiment, she felt physically depressed, especially when the last of the work crew would head home in the evening, leaving her all by herself. Margaret wrote in her diary, It was Peter himself who brought me out of it every time without exception. At the end of the experiment, John and Margaret had discovered a number of things about dolphins. The first being that dolphins, when given the option, will seemingly choose the company of humans over other dolphins. They knew that dolphins were intelligent creatures that could not only learn things quickly, but actually enjoyed learning. The research carried out at the Dolphin House raises questions about consciousness, language, extraterrestrials, and permission. A major problem lied in the dolphins' inability to give any form of consent. Is it okay to conduct experiments like this in the name of science? Now, I know that I've given you a lot to unpack today, but I cannot wait to hear from you guys. Had you heard about the Dolphin House and the experiments that went on there prior to today's video? Let me know if you think that you would be able to move in and live with a dolphin full time. Personally, I think on paper it sounds fun. I'm just not sure how it would be actually getting into it. But I do say that I think Margaret had a once in a lifetime experience that very few people get to take part in. And just thinking about summertime, being in St. Thomas, getting to work with dolphins, it sounds, it does sound absolutely fantastic. But let me know what you guys think. If you enjoyed today's video, give it a thumbs up. And hey, while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on the next investigation. Now I'm off to see if I can communicate telepathically with my brother's cat.